In healthcare, there is a type of headache that sends chills down our spine. It's called a thunderclap headache. A patient usually describes it as the worst headache of their life. Yesterday, I spoke about a 50-year-old woman who complained of a headache just like this, and then she collapsed. This is a terrifying reality of a ruptured brain aneurysm. So let's break down how we make this diagnosis and how we treat it. Intracranial aneurysms are found in about 2-5% to of the population. That's 6.8 million people. There is a person that has a brain aneurysm rupture every 18 minutes. It's over 30,000 ruptures per year. September is Brain Aneurysm Awareness Month, so let's talk about it. We've got a 50-year-old woman. She's perfectly healthy, no past medical history other than high blood pressure, and she suddenly collapsed while having dinner with her family. The family says she clutched her head mid-sentence and said that she had the worst headache of her life and then she blacked out. She started vomiting, they called 911. This was the CT scan of her brain performed upon arrival to the emergency department that showed a large amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage. All of this white stuff in the brain here is blood, including a small intracerebral hemorrhage near her right middle cerebral artery. This is a pretty classic scan of someone with a ruptured MCA aneurysm. What you're seeing on the CT is something classic that we call the star sign. The radiological appearance of a star when blood fills the basal cisterns, the area of the brain where the circle of Willis sits. That bright white hyperdensity that we're seeing is acute blood. So if you see the basal cisterns glowing like a star, it's subarachnoid hemorrhage until proven otherwise. Aneurysms are little bulges in the side of the wall of a blood vessel. What happens is the side wall of the vessel can become weak and you start to get bulging of that blood vessel. And you can imagine if this thing continues to get weaker or larger, it can rupture. You see, our brain has a distinct anatomy of different blood vessels that supply different parts of the brain. We have four main arteries that enter our head from our neck, two vertebral arteries, which are in the back, and two arteries called the carotid arteries in the front. Those come together right here to form the circle of Willis. What you talking about, Willis? I'm talking about how your brain gets oxygen. On any patient that comes in with stroke-like symptoms, we perform a CT scan of the patient's brain as well as a CTA to check the blood vessels. A CTA is where we inject dye into an IV that goes into the patient's blood vessels and we can evaluate the blood vessels in the brain to see if there's any vascular abnormalities, such as an aneurysm. The CTA can also show the lack of flow through a blood vessel, such as in a stroke. Therefore, it's a pretty common test that we perform in the ER. We can decide then if formal diagnostic cerebral angiography is needed, which is where we take the patient to the endovascular lab, where we can cannulate someone's blood vessel and actually inject dye to get much better pictures like right here. And right here in our patient, we see the middle cerebral artery aneurysm that ruptured. About 30% of all aneurysm ruptures are the MCA. It's because the MCA bifurcates and that leaves a spot right here that can become weak. Think of a water hose with all this pressure hitting right here and then needing to split off. The weak point that develops will be right here. And that's what can happen. There are two different types of aneurysm. One is called a saccular aneurysm, which is where you have a focal point of weakness that causes the aneurysm, or a fusiform aneurysm where the entire blood vessel wall is weak and it kind of bulges out. The majority of aneurysms are saccular aneurysms, and that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. Risk factors are advanced age, hypertension or high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, alcohol use, atherosclerosis of the blood vessels, which can cause them to be weak, as well as cocaine use, which can cause a surge in your blood pressure and can lead to aneurysms. There is also some inherited risk factors, connective tissue diseases, including Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Marfan syndrome, polycystic kidney disease, amongst many other conditions. Compared to the general population, someone with a first degree relative like a parent that has a cerebral aneurysm is three to seven times more likely to have an aneurysm. If you have a family member that has a diagnosis of an aneurysm, it's important to talk to your doctor to see whether or not you should be screened. I could make a video that's several hours long about how we diagnose and treat aneurysms as well as how they form, so I'm going to try to keep it really simple. We need to treat the aneurysm that ruptured. Please note that that aneurysm is not continuously bleeding. What happens typically is there is a burst of the blood vessel, 
it bleeds a little bit and then it will clot off so there is not continuous bleeding. And if there is, it's likely those patients that die on the scene and do not even make it to the hospital, which is about one third of patients. So in other words, these patients that we're treating are not actively bleeding, but they do run the risk of re-rupturing that aneurysm, which is up to 23% in the first 72 hours. Of course, the consequences of a re-bleed can be catastrophic with up to a 60% mortality rate. So we need to clip or coil the aneurysm. Those are two vastly different procedures. Coiling of an aneurysm is something done endovascularly where there's no actual cut on the head and we can go through a catheter and feed small little wires into the dome of the aneurysm and cause it to clot off. Basically obstruct the flow of any type of blood within the aneurysm dome. Clipping, which is a more traditional approach, is where we can open up the patient's head with surgery and place a clip over the aneurysm's neck and cause it to be completely occluded. How we decide who gets clipped versus coiled really depends on a lot of different factors, including the location of the aneurysm. Here you can see in our patient that an endovascular neurosurgeon went in there and coiled off that aneurysm. Here's what those coils look like on the x-ray. After the aneurysm is secure or obliterated, we then focus on the medical management of any complications that can happen after. And these patients are usually pretty sick for a few weeks after an aneurysm rupture. They are at risk of hydrocephalus, which is what that drainage tube was treating. And some patients even go on to need permanent shunting or diversion of the spinal fluid to the belly to decrease the intracranial pressure that can even persist in the long term. These patients are also at risk of seizures, hyponatremia or low sodium, deep venous thrombosis or blood clots, cardiopulmonary complications such as arrhythmias or even cardiomyopathy. So they got a lot going on. But one of the most concerning things that we want to try to prevent is delayed ischemia. That's called cerebral vasospasm, which is where a normal blood vessel can actually start to squeeze down and decrease blood flow to the brain and that can cause a stroke. Believe it or not, that happens in 30 to 40% of patients that suffer a subarachnoid hemorrhage. There is a complex pathway of some of the factors that we think contribute to vasospasm. And these are important mechanisms to understand because it actually explains how we treat these patients to help prevent vasospasm. Here's a good diagram that helps explain this. Treatment and management of patients with ruptured aneurysms can be extremely complicated. And the long-term complications in patients can vary depending on the severity of the brain damage from the rupture. Only one third of patients that suffer a ruptured aneurysm actually recover to back to normal. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is a major life event and can lead to long-term medical complications, including depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, speech difficulties, memory function difficulties, and persistent cognitive dysfunction, along a vast other amount of neurological issues that may persist. Of course, these patients are treated with intense rehab, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and psychotherapy. So how did our patient do? The patient that I presented at the beginning of the video had an MCA aneurysm that was treated by coiling. As with most aneurysm patients, she had a lengthy stay in the hospital and an extensive rehabilitation after. She made a pretty good recovery, but she still suffers from neurological deficits in her memory and cognition. Remember that September is Brain Aneurysm Awareness Month, so here's the takeaway. A ruptured aneurysm is a true neurological emergency. Recognizing the symptoms early, understanding the risk factors, and knowing what treatment options can literally save a life. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week, and I'll go through another case.